welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here this Thursday night live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake. And we have a lot of information today dealing with uh, four court cases, both in state and federal, and just giving you the lowdown of uh, a little bit of how the process works and where to find information about these cases and how to navigate the, uh, some of the online, at least the state's online system for uh, finding out about a court case, what's going on in the court case. Uh, <clears throat> also, we're going to talk about precinct caucuses. I want you to call in with your comments of how your precinct caucus went and uh, information. I'm still trying to find out if the DFL caucus had uh, people sign the back of their ballots. I don't know if they took any strong ballots, straw ballots, or in electing precinct, precinct captains or chairs, whether they uh, had people sign the back of the ballots. <laughs> no secret ballot there. Um, I don't know if they did it at this level. We know they've done it at the higher level. But it's just interesting. But if you have a comment or question, call into the show, 651-747-3838. We're glad, glad to have your comments or questions. Uh, also, um, if you don't want to call in, you can email me at speechlessmn at gmail.com. Give us your comments, and uh, eventually I'll get to them. Or if you have ideas for the show, let us know. And then, if you want to watch the show later or see past shows, uh, you can go to youtube.com backslash speechlessmn. If you do that, it will come up with Speechless, and which is a Lady Gaga video. And then you click Speechless, and then it says, we search for Speechless. Did you mean Speechless MN? And then you click on Speechless MN. My videos come up. Or you can search my name, Tim Kinley, and Speechless, and my videos will come up. So uh, evidently, the show does, uh, helps advertise Lady Gaga. Not, not real excited about that. Um, I don't think if you search for Lady Gaga, my show comes up. But anyway, all right. Uh, Four cases we're going to go over uh, today. Uh, Rue versus Bergstrom, uh, a decision that's been waiting for a year. We're also going to, it's about 50 year restraining orders. We're going to go over State versus Andrew Henderson, uh, who was taking pictures of a sheriff uh, doing her job, and he got arrested for obstruction of justice and disorderly conduct. And then also the state versus McDonald Shimota for a, a, an attorney who was arrested for taking pictures in the courtroom. We talked a little bit about that last week, but we ran out of time, so I couldn't get into some of the greater details of that case. And then uh, we're going to start off here. Well, then there's a case coming up in federal court um, where there's a challenge to free speech rights, um, whether a person can make, it's against the law to make deliberately false statements regarding the effect of a ballot question. Okay, it's against the law to do that. And people are being prosecuted on that, but you, there's a problem with that. You know, you know I don't, the person doesn't have a right to lie. Uh, they can, they don't have a right to, uh, but deliberately lying about the effect of a ballot question, how do you know? How do you know that it's a lie? You can't know. It may be true, but to charge somebody for something that hasn't taken place yet, you know, you don't know whether it's a lie or not. Okay, those we're going to get into, but before we do that, I just want to discuss the problem with the Girl Scouts right now in that they are um, promoting Planned Parenthood and, as they would say, reproductive rights for girls in the Girl Scouts. And a lot of money is, uh, uh, a bunch of money is going to uh, abortion rights, the right to kill your baby. And our young girls are being taught about this under the guise of reproductive right, realizing that it's really giving a woman a choice to kill her child and because that's all it is all it will ever be and so I'm not buying Girl Scout cookies anymore uh, it was a good organization it, it was 
did great things for women uh, and girls and a lot of good times were had but now to be promoting and teaching reproductive rights to these Girl Scouts uh, um, is, is horrible. And of course the phraseology here, reproductive rights versus what really happens is you kill your child. Uh, you know, it just, it's the marketing game that goes on and it's deceptive and um, there's, there's a case of uh, deliberately false statements regarding the effect of an abortion. <laughs> That's, maybe they should be charged under that. I wonder if there's a law about that. But uh, I want you to know about this case here. Eric uh, Cardle is the attorney on this case, and uh, we've seen a number of his cases and covered a number of his cases because he's standing up for free speech rights. He's standing up for our constitutional rights. Um, a very brave attorney. Uh, and, you know, he does everything by the book, so it's very hard for the judiciary to come after him, not that they uh, won't or haven't. Uh, it's just really, really hard for him, for them to do that. So there is an Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals hearing on February 13th at the U.S. District Courthouse in St. Paul. And we've had a number of press conferences from there that we've showed on this show. Uh, now that's at Kellogg and Robert Street, the northeast corner of Kellogg and Robert. And <clears throat> um, what's interesting about this case, well, the, the court case starts at 9, okay, but you got to realize there's four cases there, and they're the fourth case to be heard. And believe it or not, attorneys don't show up on time and parties don't show up on time or even at the federal level, there'll be negotiation going on before the hearing. So a case may happen here. There's usually about, a, it may happen earlier, but some time has been allotted to this case. So they're saying be there by 1030 or so uh, for, you know, you should be there in time. With three cases ahead of you, it's most likely that they'd be heard. Um, so this is February 13th. Uh, what day is that? Um, is that Thursday? Or what's the day? Yeah, it's next Thursday. Um, so what they're going to do, what this is, is um, appellants brought this 42 U.S.C. 1983 challenge. What that means, it's just a, a civil rights challenge. Civil rights are being violated, in this case, the right to free speech. Um, to Minnesota Statute 211B.06 because it subjects citizens to criminal prosecution for making deliberate false statements regarding the effect of a ballot question made to promote or defeat that ballot question in violation of the First Amendment. Uh, just unbelievable statute. I'm going to have to do more research as to who put this in, who voted for it, and why didn't they read the U.S. Constitution and understand that this would be a violation of free speech for the main reason you don't know if it's false. It may be true. How do you determine whether it's deliberately false? This court previously reversed the district court's dismissal of appellant's amended complaint and remanded with instruction to apply strict scrutiny to appellant's claims. In other words, what went on here is the, um, the subjects, the appellants on this case, uh, lost in district court. They appealed it to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is on the fifth floor of the same building. The Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals re said, no, you didn't apply the right st standards. Since this is a constitutional fundamental right issue of free speech, you have to apply that standard to this, and it's a tough standard to overcome. So the lower court provided a lower standard uh, uh, on this issue where you didn't have to have, you know, you didn't just, there wasn't as much proof that you had to show or the, the effect of this. And the appellate court said, no, go back, lower court, hear this all over again. 
provide strict scrutiny, see if you come up, see if your facts come up at the same, uh, the same issue. So it needed to go back um, to the appellate court, uh, to uh, district court, and that's what's going on here. And on remand, uh, the district court denied appellant summary judgment motion and granted respondents summary judgment motion. <laughs> okay, so it goes back to district court. And so the appellants in this case now going up again to the appellate court the 13th time. Coming back to the district court, the appellant said, hey, based on the uh, what the... Uh, Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals said, District Court dis dismissed this case against our clients because you now got to provide strict scrutiny and, you know, there's, y you can't do it. And the court then went and the District Court denied the summary judgment for the appellants and ruled in favor of the respondent. So now the appellants are taking that decision back up to the Eighth Circuit's Court of Appeal. Um, and the appellants request that this court reverse the district court's judgment and remand with instruction to enter judgment in favor of appellants and issue a permanent injunction prohibiting the enforcement of Minnesota Statute 211B.06. Uh, fascinating process that go on, goes on here. So we're uh, back up in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals on this issue, and uh, we'll see what happens uh, with the summary uh, judgment decision. Now, if they lose that in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, the summary judgment, then they go back to district court, have the hearing all over again. Uh, quite a process, uh, expensive. But if they win summary judgment, it's a lot cheaper. Not that the respondents won't go and uh, reverse, um, ask that decision to be uh, reversed. So a lot of back and forth. Uh, we'll see how serious people are on this. But it's a uh, bad deal. I mean, that <coughs> our lawmakers don't understand free speech. A lot of stuff going on in future shows here coming up. We're going to have uh, uh, Pro-Life Action Ministries come on. Uh, we're also going to have the bullying bill issue coming forward. We're also going to have, and what's really happening in there, again, it's a, a denial of free speech, and it's promoting um, the, the gay lifestyle uh, and demoting Christianity. It really ends up being bullying against Christians. Uh, and then also coming up on the show in the next couple weeks will be, uh, again, uh, the group Minnesotans Against Common Core. Uh, they'll be back with their updates on what's going on in the legislature, what is Common Core about, and how it needs to be defeated, and what the effect of it is on our teachers, and more importantly, on our students. So some big shows coming up uh, that I think you need to be uh, informed about. I need to be informed about anyway. So um, I just want you to know some of the processes that I've been involved with here this last week. I've been doing a lot of research, reading uh, a lot of cases. And one case we've been following, and let's go to graphic 7, put that up. Basically, you'll see the court number here. This is uh, uh, Rue versus Bergstrom. This is about a 50-year-old 50 50 year restraining order. And on December 11th, 2012, there was a Supreme Court hearing about this case, whether 50-year restraining orders, especially when there's no findings of fact ever on that case, can be constitutional. It was heard 13 months ago, December 11, 2012. Still, the Minnesota Supreme Court has not answered that question. 
what is going on with the Minnesota Supreme Court? What do they have to wait for? Why can't we find out information on this case? What, I mean, what, what is happening here? This is outrageous that this is taking this long. Um, and the reason it's outrageous is because now this person cannot appeal to the United States Supreme Court on this case or move the case forward or do anything with it because nothing's happened. Now, I did look up on the website and it says it's post-decision. Well, what does that mean? Um, you know, we're waiting, we're waiting for the decision. There's nothing that's come out and it's not showing up on, on the website here. So I need to follow up some more with that, but uh, just to, I need to call the administration to see what's happening there. But in that, this Rue versus Bergstrom, um, other things happened in this case. Not only the 50-year restraining order, which in my opinion is totally unconstitution, unconstitutional, this man was arrested by the Woodbury police, put in a jail for 56 days, and nobody knew he was there. They filed no charges against him. They did not tell the prosecutor that he was there. 56 days, nobody knows that you're there, okay, in, in the system. The prosecutor somehow finds out, they're looking, who is this guy, what is he here for, and immediately lets him out, okay, gives him bail or whatever. I don't know if there was bail or not, but lets him go. But you, no charges. So you can't, you can't be in, they have to charge you within 48 hours or they got to let you go. No charges, 56 days. Okay, so he files a federal lawsuit. And in that federal lawsuit, it was Bergstrom versus Rue versus the police officers versus the, uh, you know, the, the people that were involved in this scam on him. And uh, his attorney ends up getting sick, sick. filing deadlines, deadlines were missed by both sides. The other side wasn't complying with give, giving briefs. They were playing a hardball game. And then since they weren't doing their uh, deposition, uh, they, since they weren't doing discovery, the other side wasn't giving discovery. And then they weren't, they said, well, we'll do our deposition for, you can deposition us first, my understanding, you can deposition us first, but discovery We'll do that after the deposition. Well, no, that's not how it works. You do the, you do the dis, uh, dep discovery first, then you, you'd you go with the uh, deposition. Um, so it's, uh, th so then that side, in their delays that they were doing, files a motion to have it dismissed for not timely filing things and putting this on having this go too long. And of course the attorney did get sick, but the federal court didn't accommodate this attorney for her ends up being a disability. Would not accommodate the disability. So if you got a prob hearing problem, um, disability is accommodated. If you're in a wheelchair, the disability is accommodated. I, you know, if there's some type of disability going on, you know, the courts have to accommodate you. However, not if you have seizures, evidently. Not if you uh, get sick and it's an ongoing problem that needs to be fixed. That doesn't matter. So it was ruled that, uh, yeah, the case is dismissed. Uh, and then there was appeal on that ruling that the case be dismissed. And it went up in July of last year. There was a hearing in the federal appellate court. So. You know, I was doing research. I went down to federal court to try to do research on this and um, wasn't finding anything. I finally went to the clerk of court at the Eighth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals and I asked the clerk, um, you know, is there a way to find, look at information? Is, you know, most places you can go in the courtroom, you can find information, go on a website. Well, the Eighth Circuit Federal Court Appeals has no way for you to look up their cases for free um, or otherwise. 
<laughs> they, there's nothing in their system in the Eighth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals in St. Paul that lets you look up any case. Uh, you have to go online yourself and do it yourself, nothing there. So they, they were nice there, um, very polite. Well, what case are you looking at? And, and so I gave them the number, and they're, they're used, uh, oh, that's not it. That's for the Minnesota Appellate Court. But for the federal case, I gave them the number, and, and I asked them a question. Well, how long does it usually take for the Court of Appeals to answer a complaint? or uh, answer an order or a motion. And they go, well, the most it usually takes is 90 days. And I says, oh, okay. Um, can you tell me how long this case is? And they look up and they go, oh, wow. Um, it's been six months. You know, this is unusual. <laughs> So what's going on here? I mean, this guy is getting creamed by the courts with these delays. What is the big deal about this case that the uh, federal Minnesota Supreme Court and the federal Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals can't answer the questions? Something's wrong here. I, I don't know what's going on. And there's no way to find out. I'm going to try to dig a little deeper. I'm going to write the judges a letter and say, what, what's going on? Why haven't we heard an answer on this case? I got a lot of work to do here, <laughs> you know? The courts are not behaving like they should normally behave. So, and at two times for this one person, both the Minnesota State and the federal courts? Wow, what's going on? Uh, interesting day down at the uh, federal courthouse. Plus, in that aspect, why I, the other reason I was going down there was to find out at the Federal Court of Appeals and at the Federal District Court, the Eighth Circuit, can I film in the courtroom? Of course, I know the answer. The answer is no. Federal courts doesn't let cameras or the press film in their courts, although they do take, there are cameras in the courtroom. There is, they do film something. We don't know what. So I went and said, well, who talked to the clerk of court? Fantastic guy, very friendly, quick, answers your questions as best he can. You know, you know, he's not trying to push you off. I says, well, who, who do I ask to get permission to film? And he, co he goes, well, it'd be the chief judge. I believe it's Davis. I believe his first name's Michael Davis. You have to request it from him. Well, the whole purpose of doing that is to establish a paper trail of being denied my constitutional rights as part of the press to film a federal court case. But the court's opinion is, well, you can come in there and write things down. Uh, you can't record, you know, but you can write things down and, and see it and report it as it goes. Well, that's not good enough for me. That's not good enough for this press. It's not good enough for you because you don't get to see what goes on in the courtroom. You don't get educated. You don't get to see how people are treated or some of the problems with that are going on in our courts. Huge problem. Why hasn't the major media pushed this issue? And I haven't found court cases uh, that have dealt with this issue. They've gone a little ways, but have stopped, which means it hasn't gone the whole way, but the end result is no filming in the courtroom. So um, that's kind of that whole part of the Rue versus Bergstrom issue. So in light of that, <clears throat> I got an email from another court case um, telling me about another court case that I talked about on the show already, State, State versus Andrew J. Henderson, and uh, re it reminded me about it. Oh, I need to, I need to look at that court case, what, what's going on here, because this was a man who took a picture of a sheriff while they were doing their job and dealing with a medical emergency, but the uh, photographer in this case, Andrew Henderson had no clue as to what was going on. And there was a police car, there was an ambulance, there was this activity going on. 
he was filming in a public location outside his apartment building and um, he gets arrested. So I'm going to tell you the rest of the story after we take this uh, phone call here. <laughs> so caller, uh, welcome to the show. Do you have a comment or question? Tim Kinley. Hey. Thank you for trying to demystify the court system, the federal court system. Right, the thank you. most uh, mysterious of everything. Yes. The one question I have is, it seems, uh, have you figured out an explanation why the government believes that they can film and record and save the data of almost anybody in any time in a public space outside their house? And they can do it however they feel like it with whatever cameras they have. And yet, a, a, a citizen in the United States seems to be extremely limited. Or a member of the press seems to be extremely limited in how they can film the government. Ding, 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 ding. You win the award. You get it. The government is putting us as subjects. It's to be the other way around. You're exa I mean, that, that is the issue right there. That's a central issue. Man, we are now in a police state or trying to be held in a police state. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Continue on. I did mean to. Continue <laughs> on. <laughs> now, I didn't know. Okay, like you said, there's a constitutional issue there. Freedom of the, a citizen, freedom of the press to watch the government and how they're, uh, honored, how they're conducting the business, public business. Is that something that the uh, federal government could pass a law? Apparently, the court systems don't look, the federal court system don't, doesn't look at the uh, U.S. Constitution as a federal law that they need to have force. Would it be possible for the U.S. Congress to pass a federal law that requires the uh, federal court to abide by it? Absolutely. Also, on a, 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 a separate issue, and I would be kind of curious to know if you've heard if there's any attempt to pass that to federal law. And another issue, this, this issue of access to federal court records. Now, I'm under the impression that the federal court is not a pseudo-governmental agency, but is the actual, actual government entity. And this idea that you can look up cases and look up the record free of charge just to review seems very odd and a terrible uh, precedent. I know there was a student, I believe, at Harvard University that was downloading these cases on the federal court system, PACER, and they charged him with all kinds of crimes because he was making them public on the Internet. And because of how the federal government was retaliating against him, and I guess that would be the U.S. Attorney's Office, and uh, they were harassing him, uh, he ended up committing suicide. Wow. It seems odd that, uh, wow. that you can't take the information, which is public record, and review it free of charge. Is there any explanation from anybody on that? Thank you. Well, great questions. Uh, I don't have an explanation for that. Um, I, I think they should be open to the public and free to the public because we're paying for it with our tax dollars. This is, these are people using the people's court system. We're paying the judges and we should be able to see what they say and get that free. I. If you go on the PACER system, and, and that's the name for the federal cases, if you want to look at a case, you can go on the PACER system and look up any case in the federal court system. Uh, actually, if you, go to the, uh, if you go to the U.S. Supreme Court website, you can actually look up cases, hear the audio transcript. Uh, I believe you can get transcripts. This is something fairly new, um, you know, within the last 10 years. Um, and you can see what's going on. I, I mean, you can't, you don't get the video, but at the district court level, uh, you have to go on PACER. Just to look at the document, you have to pay for it. 
And then that means you might as well print it out because if you look again, you got to pay again. Uh, but per document, the maximum charge is two dollars and forty cents. Otherwise, it's ten cents a page. If you go um, and but a transcript is different because transcripts usually end up being can end up being you know a hundred two hundred pages long then it's ten cents a page and you get uh, somewhere a dollar fifty worth free for a quarter you know so you can um, no if it's under fifteen dollars yeah if it's under fifteen dollars for a quarter they don't charge you so you can print off 150 pages or look at 150 pages for free. Uh, and so you might as well take advantage of that while you can and stagger things out. But I, I just think it's wrong. This is public information. But if you want to, you can go down to the 8th Circuit in St. Paul off uh, Kellogg and Robert. And for district court, you can look up a case and read it there and look at it for free. But not, not if you go up to the fifth floor to the appellate court, you can't look at it for free. It's just not going to happen. Um, why? I, I just, I don't know. It's, it's baffling to me that the court seems like they're not subject to the Constitution uh, for as far as freedom of information or freedom of the press. I, I do not get that. Uh, but man, great information. That's so sad about that guy. Um, he didn't, he certainly didn't have to commit suicide because I don't think he would have been uh, charged, had to pay too many fines or whatever. But I think he did a service to our country by posting these things online so we can actually see what was being said. Okay, um, so back to state. Let's see, there was another question. Um, no, I can't remember it. Okay, back to State versus Andrew Henderson. I'm, I'm going to give you a um, primer here on how to go in and look at some court cases. And I'm going to show you some of the problems that I've been having w with court cases on the system and being able to find them. So let's go to the scan converter here. And... Um, if we can bring it up on the screen. This is the Minnesota Judicial Branch website. I think it's a very, very good website. If you take some time, get to know how it works, um, a lot of information there. I, I just think it's done very, very well. I already have it up here, but as you can see here, it says uh, www.mncourts.gov. Well, can you remember that? I don't. So what I do is I type in, in the search bar over here, MN Judicial Branch, and then I do a search. And then up comes a Google search here, and it says Minnesota Judicial Branch. Well, from right there, I can go to access case records in this section right here. But I don't do that. I, I go to the front just to see if there's anything else there. And then you get on that page, and you can uh, scroll down. Now, it just happens for technology and computer reasons. The screen here is a little bit bigger. Uh, you know, so you have to move it around a little bit. But here on this side, about the courts, the Supreme Court, you find out who your justices are. Court of Appeals, the judges there. A lot of information to find. But here, what we want to do is we want to find a court case. And so you click on Find a Court Case. <clears throat> and then it gets you to the find a court case section and I want to find a district court case and access trial court cases so we're going to click on that but you can also find appellate court cases and you can find out where things are in line in the appellate court and if we have time we'll get into that in a little bit but uh, so I wanted to find out what was going on with this uh, Andrew Henderson and then when you click access case records then you got to scroll down to the bottom that you accept that you understand limited case record information they're unofficial records you know not everything's complete on there but you agree uh, that 
you understand that, so you can't really use it for anything, <laughs> you know, legal. So in this case, this happened in Ramsey County, so what I want to do is I want to select a location. I don't have to, but this is a way of filtering things out. So I'll go down here and find my location, which will be Ramsey County. And I know that's a criminal traffic case. It's not a family, a juvenile, probate, mental health, or civil case. So it's a criminal traffic. I click on that. Then I go to criminal traffic petty case records. Click on that here. So I do that. And then it asks for a uh, password here. And here's a problem. It's hard to read these things. But you've got to type that in, VK, I think that's a, well, I can't tell what that is, whether it's a G or an O, so I'm going to reset it. There we go. I can do that one. So RA69, and I'm going to try to go by a name here, so I'll go defendant, and I'll type in the last name, Henderson and first name Andrew. Okay, and then I will go down to the bottom here and click search. So anybody with the name Andrew Henderson is going to come up. Well, <clears throat> this is what I get. Uh, I get this case here, but it's a closed case, and that's all I have. But that's not the case. This is the, actually the same guy. He had a Possession of pistol, assault weapon, under eight, age 18. All right, well, that was closed and dealt with, but it isn't the current case, so why isn't it there? I just don't know why it isn't there. So I'll go back to the search, and I happened, since I called him up, or I was uh, texting him or uh, Facebooking him on his case, I called him up and... Um, got the case number, otherwise I wasn't going to find it. So I go here and click case number. And uh, I'll redo that because otherwise it will come up with an incorrect thing. So I'll go A4W6. Now if you go back down to the Minnesota Supreme Court, you don't have to do this on their system. Uh, so I have the case number here. And it is 62 and S U. You don't have to put these dashes in there, but they're there. C R stands for criminal. And 12 is the year that this was issued, and the case number is 4910. I'll put that in. And I'll search there, and there it comes up. His case, same guy. There you see, there's the case number. There you see the charge, obstruction, legal process, uh, lawful execution, and then disorderly conduct. Those are the two chance, uh, charges. It's before Judge uh, Diane Allshouse, and then We'll click on that number and then you get the case there. You find out who the attorneys are. Um, the, uh, the defendant attorney is John Lundquist. He's with the ACLU, is defending Andrew Henderson. And Kevin Michael Beck is the prosecutor in this case, or the lead prosecutor dealing with this. Then we see the charges again. And then on this side, we see all the dates of everything that's taken place, uh, what's gone on. It's a long list here, and we finally get to uh, the time of the court case. And here we see this going on a long time. This, again, is also over a year's time length, which that happens in criminal cases. You may want to have a speedy trial. You may not want to. But they actually requested a speedy trial once this started to drag on and on. And, of course, once you request it, you get it. It's a constitutional right. Uh, it's not waived. Uh, you can waive your right to a speedy trial, but then you can ask for it again um, because of games that get played. 
and we're going to see that a trial date was set on for jury trial from 1-3-2014 and it's been reset now uh, well a number of times uh, and this is for the jury trial so they done the arraignment, they've done the uh, pre-trials, uh, they dealt with the motions, now uh, jury trial. And here it is, uh, speedy trial's been asked for, we're looking over a month, almost two months now, uh, at least since he's asked for a speedy trial. And you gotta do it, my understanding, within 30 days. So now it's been reset out to 225 2000, February 25th, 2014. Okay, that's his case. Now, I, I just bring that up. That's how you can find out records and see some of the information that's in the records. Now you can bring it back to me, uh, control room there. I paid attention because when I heard about this in the press, you know, you have the right to film any police officer. Of course, that's kind of the theme here, the right to film, and the right to film court cases and your public servants out doing their business out in public. And so I asked one, I asked Andrew Henderson if he would come on the show and explain his case. He said no. His attorney says no. We've got to wait till after the trial. And then I said, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask to film this. And he said, well, I, I've already asked to film it, and the prosecutor said no. Uh, and then the judge agreed with that. So he tried. Well, I told him, I haven't tried yet, so I will try to film this, and we'll see what they say. Now, I bring this issue up of why the prosecutor denied it, the filming, is because in Dakota County, I tried to film a case down in Dakota County, too, but I was also denied down in Dakota County because of the prosecutor. The prosecutors aren't wanting these cases to be filmed. What's going on with our prosecutors? You know, uh, you know, of course, then the judge who can overrule a prosecutor on these filming issues, she gets off the hook of having to make a decision because the prosecutor made that decision. If the, if the, um, uh, defendant and the prosecutor said both said yes well the judge could still say no okay but it's a lot harder for a judge to say no then it's all on the judge anyway it's all on the judge anyway and that's why I'm setting all this up doing all this writing also in federal court and district court to get to film because it's a denial of my constitutional rights as part of the press and um, I'm making a paper trail they know it. They, they figured it out. There's no nothing hiding here <laughs> about what's going on. Um, they don't care. You know, go ahead, do it if you want to spend the money. We're the judges. We can do what we want. Who cares what the Constitution says? So, again, not only am I, do I have the Dakota County all set, you know, for the lawsuit because I was denied. Now we're going to try to get Ramsey County and now the federal courts going to try to get them too. Okay, we have another caller here. Caller, uh, comment or question? Thanks for calling in. Jim Kinley, thanks for continuing to try to film these uh, these hearings and filming all this government action. I, I, that's a huge tragedy that uh, that young person and. Uh, little Canada that was trying to fill the actions of the police department and what they're putting him through is abominable. Uh, you know, the amount of uh, uh, harassment that they're dealing, they're putting towards him is unbelievable. And the prosecutor, I do not see, like you said, where in the world he's coming from and under what mission he's following. The best that I can come to understand this was is what Michelle Gross said. What they're doing is they're trying to send a message to other citizens, don't film your government, don't film right. your police force, right. because even if you could win in the end, it's going to be very expensive, it's going to cause a lot of headaches. You can't it's get jobs. You just do not participate in your government. Right. And that is the message sent by that prosecutor 
and by the city officials of Little Canada, including right. the city manager, who continues to let that go. And the, the judge, whoever that is, not to dismiss this automatically, is not doing a service to the United States Constitution or his duty to the office. And right. they should be, uh, I, you know, I don't even know how they can sit in those positions of public authority, public responsibility, and public accountability and let that go on in this country. Yeah, Have you heard any more about any of this? Uh, is there uh, how much, you know, I'm not interested in how much expense this has cost the government. I'm watching, the, I'm interested in the harm that it has caused this individual. And if right. he ever does get a chance to sue that prosecutor and sue the city of Little Canada and sue the police force who is subjected to this, I can just, I mean, he should, uh, he should take account of all the harm, the psychology harm, and all the uh, financial harm this case has caused him and will, uh, and it will continue to cause him in the future. Thank you. Well, yeah, very good comments, and it's cost the city only. The city is so far has only cost them about five thousand dollars. Well, I mean that, but the interesting thing, their budget for these prosecutions is about uh, I think sixty thousand dollars for all their prosecutions. What they have budgeted, and this one's taking a big piece, and will take more because it will go to trial. This guy's smart enough to take it to trial, take it before a jury, and he is suing. Uh, all these parties as well he should be uh, but you know you are suing the government um, and the taxpayers will have to pay for the actions of this sheriff and I believe it was a sheriff that arrested him and the city of Little Canada to prosecute him uh, they just shouldn't be doing this this sheriff should lose her job she needs to lose her job I'll get her name uh, and of course, it's hard to find the files. I'll find the files. I got to go down to the, to the uh, Supreme Court to look up the files there. You can't get them online here. I mean, if you're down at the Supreme Court, go back to the graphics here, or go scan converter. If you're down at the Supreme Court, all these documents where it says notice of uh, other document, affidavit of service, correspondence, all of that information, you go down to uh, the district court or to the Minnesota Supreme Court Library, you can click on those things, those are blue, and then you can read the file. But you sitting at home can't do that. Um, and maybe it's just a technology issue going on and they're trying to secure it and getting up to speed. And I'll give, give them credit, I mean this whole system is relatively new, uh, but you can go down there, but that's what you have to do, you, you have to take that time, take that work to find out what's going on. Um, so, um, anyway, yeah, uh, he can't find a job. He's got this charge against him. He's unemployed right now. He had a job, uh, got let go of that or for whatever. I don't know what the reasons are anyway, but he's unemployed right now. Can't find a job with that on the record. Employers just don't deal with it. And yet he is standing up for people's constitutional liberties, and he is suing all the parties. Uh, is what I understand, and I, I hope he gets millions. He should get millions because the why our government doesn't. Well, they do understand our basic constitutional rights, and they're just thumbing it. We're subjects now, is what we are. You better realize that, and you should be angry about it. You're a subject to the state. Um, you are no longer this free uh, individual. You are now a subject, and these our uh, government workers aren't being held accountable. And we'll see if the judiciary steps up to the plate. Uh, but I hope you uh, enjoyed that uh, uh, presentation there uh, about how the system works, and got to tell the story of a court case here. Um, just. Uh, going to do one more thing here because I want to show you how to um, get in the appellate courts uh, information uh, so you see what that's like. So, okay, go back to the scan converter here. Now, <clears throat> oh, 
you know, you get to the Minnesota Judicial Branch, you can Google Minnesota Judicial Branch, you click the same thing, find a court case, click on there, and instead of access trial court cases, go down and click access Supreme Court and Court of Appeals cases. And then you'll get this different document here. Welcome to the PMAX, uh, the case management system in the Minnesota Appellate Courts. Okay, and, and then you uh, accept uh, whatever they're telling you there. Um, basically, you know, that the information may not be accurate, you know, so don't treat it as, as accurate. But then comes up the case management, and you can search for a case. So if you got the case number, you search there. In this case, I'm going to search uh, for Bergstrom. And you'll, you'll uh, then that's all you need if you know the person's name. Then anybody with Bergstrom will come up. But in this case, only two people with Bergstrom, and it's the same case. And then in blue there, you click on the case number, and then just see the history of what's been filed and what hasn't been filed. And the one thing you're going to want to see here is that they had the oral argument on 12-11-2012. And the attorney in this case, of course, was Jill Clark. She had her license suspended on, uh, in January of 2013 as of December 11th, 2012, yet she was practicing on de December, as of December 7th, she had her license suspended, but she was practicing on December 11th in 2012. And there's been no order in this case, no uh, nothing in that year, in 13 months here we're looking at. Okay, uh, let's go back. You can bring it back, but that that's what your that's what the Minnesota appellate court stuff looks like. That's one place place to look up records and stuff. All right, now I want to get back on this. Uh, McDonald case, and we got a little bit of time left. Attorney Michelle McDonald Shimoda was arrested for obstruction of justice and also um, one of the um, contempt of court for taking pictures in the courtroom. Well, she was taking pictures outside the courtroom because she was told the uh, case had been canceled. And that's what was showing on the um, screens, and the case screens for the county there. It wasn't showing up or showing that it was canceled. She took a picture of that, got permission, went in the courtroom and showed that all these people were in the courtroom, but no cases were going on. The judge wasn't sitting on the bench. And this is what the case boiled down to, and this is what the hearing was about. It was fascinating. The judge, the... Um, they said, being the judge as a witness because the judge issued an oral warrant. An oral warrant. I didn't know what that meant. Okay, it's a warrant. You can issue warrants, but oral warrants, can you issue them or not? The answer is no. A judge cannot issue an oral warrant. It's against the law. This is standard practice. You can't do it. So um, they subpoenaed the judge to give testimony about the oral warrant and to have it admit that it was done. It wasn't about a work product, and he has immunities, but he can't do something outside his jurisdiction. If he issues an oral warrant, it's outside of his jurisdiction. Well, they had the two sheriffs that ended up arresting Michelle McDonald for a citation, okay? <laughs> uh, you don't arrest people for a citation unless you're... Uh, endangering yourself or others, or you're not likely to show up to a court case, and there's a third reason that didn't apply in this case. They arrested her for taking these pictures, but before they arrested her, there was a, about a two and a half hour, an hour and a half court hearing that went on some, somewhere in there, and during that time, the referees uh, the sheriffs went back to the judge and said, hey, we want to see what's on this camera that she was taking pictures of. And, the, and they testified that the judge wanted to see what was on there also, so we issued an oral warrant. 
these sheriffs didn't realize that that's a problem okay there, there needs to be a written warrant and the warrant states what can be searched and um, what it's searched for <laughs> and what they can take as property and there was nothing written so the sheriffs on the stand were asked a question well since they had no clue as to what was going on, they were asked the question, What's a, how often do uh, oral warrants get issued here? And they go, well, quite often. You know, and that, you know, if you knew that you couldn't do oral warrants, that just kind of stunned the people in the place that were watching this. And uh, I even think uh, the attorney, Grigsby, was stunned by what he had heard. <laughs> and then he goes, well, what, what judges do you know issue oral warrants? And it's kind of like between the first question and that question, the sheriff goes, wow, um, you know, well, I, I can't recall. Of course, he had just testified that Judge David Knudsen had issued an oral warrant. <laughs> okay, he could have said his name over again, but he couldn't remember the other ones. All right, then, are we out of time already? Oh, my goodness. Bottom line, he's been involved with two or three oral warrants. This sheriff is going to open up a whole new issue um, with Dakota County. We'll see what takes place there. All right, remember, folks, we got to go now. If you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week.